Um, thanks to our speakers uh, for that those uh, comments and that good information we've got. We're gonna skip questions and move on to our next presentation, which is entitled Beyond the Peanut Genome. Uh, the speaker is David Bertioli. Um, he's involved with the Center of Applied Genetic Technologies at the University of Georgia. And um, David, we'll turn this over to you as soon as we get everything ready. You notice we have, um, We've got four moderators up here because there's three people much smarter than I am <laughs> to run the equipment. So thanks to Emmy and Craig and also Rebecca for helping us up here today. And also there's lunch can be purchased in the lobby. There's a buffet for $15. So that might keep you from having to, to travel. And the break is sponsored by Birdsong that we'll have in just a little while. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Well, isn't it? It's fantastic to be here uh, with an in-person meeting after so long. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for who, who's worked hard to make this happen, and including um, those who worked into the night to make sure the presentation was all uh, working properly. And thank you very much for the chance to speak here today. Well, first of all, um, I'd like to take us back in time, uh, 22 years, uh, to the White House. morning. I want to, uh, first of all, acknowledge uh, Prime Minister Blair, who will join us by satellite in just a moment from London. I want to welcome here uh, the ambassadors from the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, France. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions, not only that they're scientists, but also scientists from China made to the vast international consortium that is the Human Genome Project. There we go. So um, that was only 22 years ago, um, the launch of the draft Human Genome Project, uh, 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. And that was a feat that was compared quite rightly to taking man to the moon. And uh, for scientists such as myself, it was a really a, an amazing thing, which the scale was, um, the mic's going a bit funny, isn't it? Um, it's an amazing thing, um, like going to the moon and, um, but, but for us, the scale, of, the scale of the data was almost unimaginable. It was uh, difficult to think um, what we would do with such data. At the time, uh, right around this time, by coincidence, Sarah and myself had decided to um, start working on peanut. This was a little bit more than 22 years ago. And there was all sorts of um, fantastic research in peanut. Um, in all sorts of areas, but because of the difficulty of peanut itself, its, its genetic complexity and the costs of the techniques, uh, peanut was really, in terms of genomics and genetics, very, at a very, very basic level. There were no genetic maps from cultivated peanut, and there were only six polymorphic DNA markers published by uh, Mark Hopkins. The idea that there might be a, um, a genome for peanut was essentially unimaginable at the time. But fortunately, the peanut industry counts with some visionary people. Um, and I'd like to thank 
Mr. George Birdsong for having that vision and for crystallizing the uh, unified effort uh, behind the peanut genome project and making that all possible. Of course, there are a lot of work of an awful lot of partners spreading internationally. Funds came from multiple sources, uh, but I'm gonna skip all of that to uh, the publication of uh, the first set of genomes. We had the realization that because of the complex hybrid structure of peanut, we would need to sequence the two ancestors of peanut first. That publication made the cover of Nature Genetics, which is um, perhaps the most um, prestigious uh, genetics um, journal. And that involved partnerships from all over the world, from USA, Brazil, China, Japan, India. It was an amazing uh, consortium effort. Following that, as technology advanced, we were able to sequence uh, tetraploid peanut itself, which was particularly challenging because of its double structure. But that was also an international effort. Now, the data that this produces is uh, it's a, roughly the same size as the human genome, somewhat more complicated to deal with because of its polyploid structure. And this is what the data looks like. It's an enormous string of A, C, Gs, and Ts. In terms of size, the peanut genome is roughly the size of 800 Bible-sized books. So, it, or 1,200 um, Tolstoy's War and Peace. So it's an enormous scale, an intimidating scale of data. But we can conceptualize it and start to break it down to make it tractable, to make it um, understandable. And the first thing is that this genome is broken into 20 group chromosomes. And if we want to describe a position on the genome, we use something similar to a GPS. We want to describe this point here, with the red arrow. We can describe it by the chromosome and reading off its distance. In this case, A9, 105 million, 345,000, et cetera. If that point is within a gene, there's about 3,500 genes in each chromosome, then because of the uh, annotation of the genome, the use of computer algorithms to predict where the genes are, there is a unique identifier for each gene. So this very simple idea, um, which is a bit like GPS coordinates, um, first of all gives us the framework but of course it needs softwares in order to database, curate, and visualize the uh, genome sequence. And there are a number of ways to do this, but peanut base, which uh, Stephen Cannon has, has been behind, has been really critically important. It's a web-based interface. You go through clicking buttons, and we can navigate, for instance, to that place on the genome that I showed in the previous slide. There's the position, there's the gene, and navigating through this, we can see predicted function and those things. So really the peanut genome took us from pirate maps to something that's much more like Google Maps. Now that's the first uh, piece of the puzzle to be able to navigate the reference genomes. But we also have another problem because we're not just interested in one genome, which is the, the reference genome of TIF runner or Ephiensis or Lorenensis. We're interested in the genomes of plants that are in peanut uh, breeding programs. So we need a method that takes a snapshot of genomes of individual plants, which we need to know what they are. 
Essentially, we needed 23 and me for peanuts. Now, the technology for this, uh, which there's a number of different technologies, but the most impactful has been uh, the AFI chip. It's a remarkable synthesis of silicon and biotechnologies. It's a silicon wafer on which DNA probes are mounted by micromachining with fluorescent probes. Using this technology, in Peggy's lab, Josh Clevenger and Peggy and collaborators uh, made essentially a 23andMe for peanuts. That scans about 45,000 regions in the genome of the peanut, and actually it's better than 23andMe because it does multiple samples at once, typically 384 samples at a time. And that gives tremendous power to apply the knowledge of the peanut genome within experiments, within breeding programs. There are other methods as well, based on the genome, which use the genome as a framework. One of them, which is very exciting, is developed by Josh Clevenger and Walid, which is called KUFU, and that leverages higher capacity um, sequencing to uh, get a, a, a view, a genotyping, a new type of 23 and me for peanuts. Now these technologies, 23 and me for peanuts, they enable new things. And uh, Sarah and I, uh, we had come across a uh, resistance in uh, Ignacio Godoy's lab, uh, which was a remarkable resistance in cultivated peanut. And we came to Georgia and our aim, our sabbatical aim, was to try and get uh, to work out the genetics that were behind this remarkable uh, resistance. Um, we can see here what a typical, um, on, on, on the, your left-hand side, there's um, a plant after not being sprayed. This was um, uh, runner 886, which was Brazil's most popular cultivar at the time, compared to this mystery source of resistance. We're using the genome uh, as a framework. We were able to tr trace back and looking at pedigrees the uh, genotype back to India in a set of lines called the CS lines, back to North Carolina with Smart and Gregory crosses in 1967, and back to a wild species called the Rachis cardenasii from Bolivia, which was collected in the 1950s. We were also able to see initially from pedigrees and later by DNA tests, that this same resistance had gone all over the world and had a tremendous impact. In fact, on average, genotypes improved by Arrakis cardenasii genetics yielded almost double those without when unsprayed. In total, we found 251 peanut cultivars and lines in 30 countries with genetics from this wild species. Now, the genetics of Arrakis cardenasii, it passed through into cultivars like Bailey, which has a remarkable uh, early leaf spot resistance, but it was lost. Fortunately, through uh, the marvels of, and, and generosity of seed exchange, this source of resistance was returned to Georgia. Now, using uh, the 23 and me for peanut techniques, we could identify two chromosome fragments from Arrakis cardinasii that bring in late leaf spot, rust, and probably web blockage resistance as well, at the bottom of A3 and the top of A2. This is the effect of those two fragments. On one side, Samuel Lemon, who did his MSc with Peggy, looking at these resistances. Uh, on one side is a peanut without those segments, and on the other side, is a peanut with those segments. Now with the genome project, at the same time as discovering these uh, segments, one is that we were able to develop 
uh, DNA markers. And it's those DNA markers that helped develop uh, CB1, CB2, and CB7 that Corley Holbrook presented yesterday. And also knowing the genome architecture of these uh, resistant fragments, we are collaborating with Jeff Dunn to combine them, the late loss of leaf spot resistance with the early leaf spot resistance of Bailey. All of these things, the speed at which it's been done, were made possible by the Genome Project and Seed Exchange. Now, this message of the benefit of the use of biodiversity and the power of seed exchange was so powerful that we managed to get into PNAS. Um, and it was edited by a legendary um, National Academy uh, of Sciences member um, from the Missouri Botanic Gardens, Peter H. Raven. And um, in that paper, we stress strongly the importance of seed exchange and how that's under threat from the conventions and uh, developments. Now, the other way to use uh, these peanut 23andMe technologies is within genetic mapping, taking a classic uh, scenario. One might take a susceptible peanut, cross it with a resistant peanut, generate progeny, look at their resistance, genetically profile them, and then link those two data sets to deduce where on the genome the resistance is harbored. The logic is really in principle quite simple. Of course, it gets complicated when you get into the details, but in principle, it's very simple. From a breeding cycle, after it's, the, 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 the genotype's been fixed, a progeny within, uh, uh, from these two parents will be essentially a mosaic of the two parent genomes mapped out there in the two colors. The logic is that resistant plants will have the gene from the resistant parent at that particular location in the genome. And susceptible plants will have the susceptible version of that gene from the susceptible parent. This simple logic allows us to assign the position of resistance genes on the genome. Since we've come to Georgia, we've managed to leverage these technologies here across um, between susceptible peanut and a tetraploid made from uh, Arrakis bachysocal, stenosperma, resistant to nematodes, generating a population. This work done in collaboration with uh, Peggy Corley, and here's Stephanie, um, inoculating the nematodes. The quantity of nematodes is calculated of each plant. Each of the plants was um, run through the AFI chip, the 23 and meter peanuts. And using those two data sets, it's possible to define which two uh, segments from Arachis tenosperma confer nematode resistance. At the same time, that develops DNA markers which can be used during the generations. So within a mass of progeny, from two parents, the DNA tests tells us which ones are resistant. Taking that forward, we've taken that to the third and fourth back crosses now. They are confirmed nematode resistant. And here they are in Tim Brenneman's and Corley Holbrook's field in Tifton. These plants, they have an elite background and you can see the pods are um, a proper confirmation. They have no sign of wild phenotype in them. All of this work done within the time that Sarah and I have been here at Georgia. So two new uh, nematode resistances within 10 years. Now this same population, we've also managed to identify a new source of rust resistance. It's the strongest source of rust resistance uh, in, in the world, we, we, we think. And there are also resistances to late leaf spot and early leaf spot. Emil Barnes will give a, give a talk about that um, population, I think, tomorrow.
in collaboration with Ignacio Godoy, we've done a similar thing, again, leveraging um, breeder knowledge with DNA technologies. Within 10 years, we have managed to incorporate leaf spot resistances, new leaf spot resistances from Arachistana sperma and magna. On the right hand, your right hand side here, there is OL4, which is the most popular variety in Brazil at the moment, in Sao Paulo at the moment, unsprayed, and the other lineages are the improved lineages with the wild genetics. So within Peanut Base, we have this framework, and, and we add to these chromosomes new traits. Of course, this isn't just us. These are the traits I've talked about, but also things like TSWB resistance, seed size, agronomic traits. In total in Peanut Base, there are 489 QTL um, linked to the genome sequence. You can really see how the peanut genome is a bit like Google Maps. Now these genetic knowledge, our genetic knowledge, the sophistication of our ability to predict goes advancing very quickly. It's all based upon reference um, genomes. Genome sequences are also synergistic with other technologies. We're particularly excited about drone technology, which allows digitalization of data from field plots and directly cross-referencing it with uh, genome data. And of course, there are other possibilities too. So in summary, the peanut genome really was a moon to the moon moment. With breeder knowledge and seed exchange, genomics turbocharges cultivar development. A lot of these developments and more are described in uh, the Peanut Research Foundation report from 2021. And at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned how um, Soraya and I started working with peanuts more than 20 years ago. And I would like to mention someone who has been present almost all of that time from Mars Wrigley and the partnership and guidance that Victor has provided us with and how Victor has made so many things possible. Thank you, Victor. Finally, I'd like to um, thank our lab who make everything possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>